the scientists, the atheists don't even understand emergence. They don't even understand how any multiplicity joins into one. Tim Keller says it so eloquently, he says that everything that bad that happened will become untrue. When you worship yourself, it usually starts with worshiping yourself, uh, then you start to die. The question of why is a, is a question about time and what precedes it. There's always, the, the, the why is always a predecessor uh, to, to, the, to the impact of the why. The, the, the world of meaning, let's say, is above and the world of potential is below. So it's really similar to what Aristotle and the uh, Greeks talked about in terms of structure. I'm Rick Walker. I'm sitting down with some of my most captivating friends to discuss topics ranging from politics and business to religion and pop culture. Welcome to Conversations at the Mansion. Jonathan Pajot, welcome to the Mansion Remote. That's wonderful to be here, at least virtually, let's say. That's right, that's right. So um, so you, you, you've you actually gained some prominence over the last uh, two or three years. Uh, your work as an iconographer, uh, slash theologian, slash, um, I guess, met metaphysical mystic, um, uh, has really caught the attention of a, a lot of folks, especially on, on YouTube. Uh, that That's how I... Uh, became accustomed with your your work and your 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 message. Just just as a generality, what what is your purpose? What is your what is your overall uh, ethos of, of what you believe and, and and why you do what you do? Well, I one of the things that I discovered, let's say, in the past few decades, I grew up as an evangelical uh, with a great love of Scripture and of uh, of Christ, and I discovered in the past few decades that the the, the patterns that you find in scripture, the, the way the stories are told, the way things are set up, is something like a map of reality, let's say. It actually describes a frame in which you can live and it, it helps you understand how things uh, exist in the world, how the stories exist and how the stories we tell amongst each other, how we frame reality. Um, and this has been something which I guess, you know, a thousand years ago would have been almost obvious to most people. But now because of modern thinking, because of scientism and materialism, we have this strange idea that the world is, um, let's say, random or just uh, it's arbitrary, and then we add meaning on top of that. But there, we're in a moment, in a cultural moment, as we watch our society break down, as we watch fragmentation in the narratives, as we see people start to be at each other's throats in, term of, in terms of uh, social cohesion, we're at a moment where people realize that there's something missing and that you know we need to be able to regain the unity that was once there in, in the way that we saw the world. And so I'm trying to kind of help people notice how the way the stories are told, whether it's in a Marvel movie or in the Bible or in whatever story that you tell, even the, the story of, of your day that you tell your spouse, that these actually need to have a pattern for you to be able to pay attention to it. And I'm trying to help people regain that capacity to understand it so that we can tell better stories uh, and that we can kind of regain a space in culture that we lost to ideologues who are manipulating stories and are trying to tell uh, stories that are really ideologically driven. Um, but a lot of, let's say normal people, let's say kind of Christian regular people, they've lost the capacity to, to tell the good stories. And so I'm trying to help bring that back. And in images too, that's why I'm exploring ancient imagery, the, the traditional image that, images that Christians kind of came up with in the first millennia, uh, because in those images, there's also this, this frame or this interrelation of, of, uh, of visual relationships that help us understand how reality exists. Sure. And it, that sounds very much like a Tolkien type of approach uh, with, with the maps. And, and maybe, maybe his friend uh, uh, Lewis, maybe a Louisian type of... Uh, Type of approach to, to meaning. Exactly. Uh, that, yeah, I that. think Tolkien and Lewis are really the, the pre, uh, precursors in terms of Christianity. Tolkien had a deep intuition about how reality works and his Lord of the Rings and his kind of mytho, mythological world is, is, is a non-Christian version. I mean, it's not Christian explicitly, yes. but it has a pattern which is uh, which just basically the same as you find in scripture. Yeah. So, so there, there's this great story. Of course, they had the group called the Inklings. They met every week to talk about their writings from the pre previous week. And and about eight years into this, Tolkien's bringing in this stuff about Lord of the Rings and, and, and about the, all the stories, stuff like that. And C.S. Lewis just has enough. He stands up and he says, he says, damn it, man, enough with the, with the damn elves and storms out. And, uh, and, and the, the, the funny part about that is, is you look at uh, Lewis's Narnia series and Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series. 
about how they, they're both sort of symbolic echoes of, of what's really happening, not only on earth, but also on heaven, in heaven. Hmm. And, uh, and, and that, that frustration was almost like he has too much in common with him. Yeah, exactly. They were so close to each other that they were inevitably going to clash at how they bring about uh, reality. And I kind of end up falling closer to, uh, to Tolkien in that vision, in the sense that, uh, let's say, Lewis had very deep, deep intuitions for sure. But the, the, the more allegorical way that Lewis did things, which is that, you know, it's like the lion is Jesus, you know, uh, and then these different characters represent different things. Uh, whereas Tolkien had a more embodied uh, version of it, which is you could say something like the different characters in Tolkien will manifest some element of Christ, but not there's not one that's like, that's Jesus. Yes. And so, you know, Aragorn has an aspect of kingship that you can understand Christ through. Gandalf has this authority and this 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 capacity to see the larger pattern that that you can find. And so it's almost more like the Bible, where in the Old Testament, you have all these figures that have elements of the Messiah, but aren't completely embodied yet in a full one like one person in one story. So it's, it's, I find Tolkien is closer to actually the way that the Bible tells stories than Lewis. Yeah. What are your, what are your thoughts about, about symbolism in heaven as it's explained in, in, in the Bible? In the Bible? Yeah. Well, I would say that there are two, there are different realities that are alluded to. There's a difference between, let's say, heaven, then the kingdom of heaven, and then the new Jerusalem, right? Yes. Those things are not, they're not exactly the same. They're related to each other. That's right. And so, Heaven is something like the place where the invisibles are, where the, where the spirits of things are. That's what heaven is. And so there's a, there's a hierarchy of being. You see that in Dante, especially as a, Dante has a really great way of helping people understand heaven. And so what is above you is your head. It's the thing that gives you identity. So as a child, your father is above you and your, your, child, your father gives you your identity and gives you a, a sense of meaning and a purpose. And so as you, as you grow up, you discover that there are other heads that are higher up, whether it be the king, whether it be angels that are, uh, that are let's say, the, the, the lords or the principalities of different aspects of reality. And that kind of goes all the way up towards God. And so this idea that God rules from heaven is related to this notion of a hierarchy of beings, a hierarchy of realities that ascend up to the infinite. And so that's really what heaven is. Uh, and then... Like the idea that we die and go to heaven is not a completely Christian understanding, at least in my, my perspective, or even in the traditional perspective. There's mostly the idea of the resurrection and then the idea of the new Jerusalem. And so the new Jerusalem, like the streets of gold and uh, you know, the pearly gates, all of that type of imagery, it's really important. It's, it's very important because what it, what it is is a manifestation of the totality of everything. And so... And you have to understand it inside the story of scripture. That is, there's a fall. And then in that fall, uh, the descendants of Cain develop a city. And the, the development of the city is actually part of the fall, right? So you, you're, you're scared. So you add walls to yourself. You add layers. You add garments of skin. You add all these things. And then you add weapons. You start to fight. All of this is part of the fall, which leads to the end of the world, to the flood in the first part of scripture. Um, so one of the aspects that is being alluded to in the New Jerusalem is the idea that God will transform this fall into glory. So even the human things that we make, even the human developments that we've created that are ambiguous, right? So our technologies are always ambiguous. They always have a light side and a dark side. You know, you have airplanes, yeah, great, you can go fast to somewhere else, but you can also kill a lot more people from airplanes than you ever could before. So all our technologies that have this amb ambiguity and you see in the idea of the New Jerusalem how uh, it says that the, in the New Jerusalem, the glory of all the nations will be gathered into that city. And so you can understand what that means. It's like all the good things of the world are shown in their glory, whether it be, uh, you know, whether it be the natural world in terms of the tree and the waters and the garden, and even the, the, the human development world in terms of technology and in terms of whatever it is humans can produce. Uh, the good aspect is what is gathered into the, into the kingdom. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think Tim Keller says it so eloquently, he says that everything that bad that happened will become untrue. Mm. And exactly. I, I think that's really, that's really kind of the, the, the ethos the, that, 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 we'll see, that we'll see in heaven. Um, 
and in and, and your conversation, and I know you know him on a personal level, so I don't want to divulge anything personal in nature, but uh, I, I went back and rewatched some of the inter- exchange that you had with Jordan Peterson last month on his podcast, and he starts tearing up talking about the sort of the fear, and, the, and I, think he, I think he uses the word tear. He's, he's afraid. But the narrative and the objective world touch, and the ultimate example of that in principle is supposed to be Christ. But I don't know what to, I'm, that seems to me oddly plausible. Yeah. Well, but I still don't know what to make of it. It's too, it, partly because it's too terrifying a reality to fully believe. I don't even know what would happen to you if you fully believed it. If you believed in the story of Christ or if you believed that history and, and let's say the narrative make meet, let's say. Both, I think, I think you, because when you believe that you buy both those stories, you believe that the narrative and the objective can actually touch. So one thing Lewis likes to say is that uh, what we don't understand is, is when when we ask to have have God reveal himself over and over in our daily lives, like if you would just reveal yourself, I would believe is that when the author walks, walks back onto the stage, the play's over. It's all mm. over. And, and, so, and so we have to use our intuition, it seems like. And, and, and it looks like the conversation you were having with Peterson on the, on the podcast was you guys were, were really working through that, that conversation. Yeah. And I think, that, I think that Jordan's reaction to all of this is a honest understanding of what it means, you know, and also this, this terror, I think, it's existential, but it's also bigger in the sense that once you once you understand the incarnation and what it implies, and it, what we talked about in terms of the idea that this narrative reality and the world of factuality actually coexist, that they actually join together. That's what the kingdom of heaven is, right? That's the place where God touches the world in the tabernacle or in in the different spaces of theophany that we see in the Old Testament. Yes. Ultimately, which re- lead into Christ. Like once you've got that. Once you understand all that implies, then it transforms everything, changes everything. It changes the way you see your life, the way you see the world, the way you see relationships. And so, uh, and I think that his his frustration at having an inkling of that, and then noticing how us as Christians we don't live up to that. Like you know, we 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 still are are preoccupied by all these trite things. You know, though we're we we supposedly have the key to the secret of the universe. But we still are, you know, and so that's why I tried to say, like, I tried to help them see that there are people that live more in that reality, reality. And, you know, we all, we all kind of exist in this hierarchy of the kingdom, let's say. That's right. Yeah, God, God didn't come to make bad men good. He came to make dead men live. Mm. And, uh, and, that, and that's the problem. Like, we, we've got to take our focus off of what other people are doing. And we've got to realize that <laughs> Christians are just moral people like the rest of us. We're, we're moral beings who make, who make mistakes. But we have a solution for the mistake. Uh, we have a solution to deal with the shame, to, a solution to deal with the repentance, and the solution to be able to turn around in that. And I think that's, that's one of the, the commonalities that whether you're in the Orthodox tradition or the Baptist tradition like myself or the other traditions is we, we, we realize that there's a way to, to come back and approach God. Hmm. And there's also, I think that we're actually in a, we're in a scary moment like in terms of historical moment, but there's also potentiality in this moment because as we, it's as if, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago, and they talked about the revolutions and when they, the atheists started to appear on the scene and to say, we just get rid of God and then we'll be better. Uh, we didn't have the fruits of that yet. And so it was hard. It's hard. You can argue on the ideas, but you don't know what that looks like because it hasn't happened. And the same with the 60s. You know, they said, liberate sexuality and, you know, we'll all be happier. And so, okay, fine. Like we did, we weren't able to stop that. It happened. But now we can see the fruits and now we can point to the fruits and say, do, do you notice that our society is completely falling apart, that fragmentation is, is rampant, that you don't know your own neighbors, right? That you, don't, that you have no place where you gather together with those around you to, to, to even be focused on the same purpose, right? The same goal, the same uh, transcendent thing, and that everything's kind of falling apart. And the same thing, even we talked about the 60s and sexual revolution. It's like at this, they, they, the last result are that people are having less and less sex in the world because they become a slave to these weird passions and they're not, they don't have the, the total vision of sexuality. So now we can point, we can say, this is the, these are the fruits, right? Like C.S. Lewis could have told you uh, 50 years ago, and he did tell you, but you weren't listening because the fruits weren't totally there yet. Now they're there. And so we have an opportunity to, to kind of gently point to that and say, well, there's, there are solutions to that. 
There are ways to, to come back together into communion, into a body. And uh, that's what Christianity has always been about. That's right. Just, just, to, just to piggyback on, on, what, on what you just said, uh, the, the, the globalist, the elitist, the, the intellectual who is uh, secularized would, would say that look at love and lust and say that their culmination is always in sex. And so they're therefore the same thing. There's no, there's no, everything's relative, but they don't understand that the consummation of both those things are two different things because it's the why, not the what that happens. It's the why that, why that consummation happens. And, and, and that's just one way that, that, they, that they tend to mistake what love, what love is. And, yeah. uh, and, and go you're totally right. And, and, uh, but I think that even in the, the, the symbolism of the Christian marriage, is really a powerful image to help people understand how, yes, those elements can come together. You know, the elements of, of love in terms of this communion with another, but also this culmination of desire into an ecstatic moment, those things actually have to come together into something. Like if you, if you separate them, and if you separate, let's say, reproduction from, uh, from sexuality completely, then you're going to start to get into weird spaces where sexuality itself is actually going to start to break down. And so, and now, we, like I said, we see the results, but helping people see again why this institution of marriage, which is a mystical institution, which is seen as an image of the relationship of God to the person, how this is a way for all the, the, the desires and the productivity of love to come together into one place. That's, that's exactly right. And, and what, they're, what they're trying to do, they're trying to remove a foundation from a house and, and hope the house still stands. They don't, they don't think the foundation is very important. And that foundation, obviously, is Judeo-Christian uh, ethics. That, that, that even goes back and proceeds way before Abraham. It goes back to the very, the very beginning of creation. And so <clears throat> the rejection, I, I, th I think what it is, they, 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 they're, they're the relativists reject the moral law, the concept of moral law, and, they, and they, they attribute natural attributes to it. Well, the, I mean, it's, there's constant contradictions in the, the, the way that things are set up. On, a, on one hand, they're naturalists and they want to believe in things like evolution, natural selection, you know, the, the survival of the fittest. And at the same time, now people have embraced this strange uh, upside down victim culture, which is like a caricature of Christianity. And so what we're really seeing the narrative break down and we're seeing these extremes uh, coexist and contradict each other and an incapacity to resolve this. Uh, and sentimentality goes a long way to get, give people the sense that, that they're doing something. And so if they have feelings, you know, and they're angry or they're outraged and they, you know, they have, uh, they have this pity for something, then they feel like they're moral, like this is a moral thing, but it's not, that's not how morality works. You know, morality has to have coherence to it or else it's just going to rip us apart. That's right. That's right. So in my, in my opinion, I think morality is, is basically a set of three different responsibilities. Uh, one's a responsibility to God. One's a responsibility to your neighbor. And one's a responsibility to yourself. And, and whenever all three of those things are in alignment, you, you, are, you are morally heading in the right direction. And what the, what the relativists think is that the morality to the neighbor can be used as a tool to be able to wedge the the legislation and the, and the agendas that they, that they want to ram through so they can set up their own institutional hierarchies that they're then the determinants of, and they avoid the other one. They reject the idea of God, and they reject, around, reject the idea of a responsibility to oneself because uh, that's relatives. Uh, it's, it's, it's relative. I, I should be able to make my own decisions, and, not, and my decisions don't impact you. Well, that's, that's categorically wrong. Hmm. Oh, you're, you're completely right. That we are definitely seeing a... And it really is not, it's not just a breakdown, it really is an inversion of the normal uh, hierarchy of things. And so the, let's say in a traditional world, you would try to join together in something which is above you, you know? Uh, and so you would try to unite in a higher, in a higher being. And so even if it is, even, even if it wasn't, let's say, uh, monotheistic Christ Christianity, even the pagans did that, right? They tried to sacrifice, do some, they did some certain rituals to be able to kind of join together in these higher realities. Of course, they were limited and they, they, they were problematic. Uh, so we, we kind of join ourselves into the infinite source of all love and all reality. Uh, and the modern way is an opposite. It's like, we're, we need to find a place where we can join. We need to find a place where we can unite. And so what we're going to do is we're going to unite in the exception. We're going to unite in the, the thing that doesn't fit. And we're going to do everything to, to make it fit, but not just that, but to mold all of reality to the exception. Uh, 
you know, I, I kind of say that it's the opposite of it's the opposite of the image of Christ who who goes out to find the lost sheep. It's like the lost sheep telling Christ to bring the flock out into the wilderness. It's like we all need to be out here in, in the desert, you know. So so it's it is an upside. And a lot of Christians are being duped by that. A lot of Christians are duped because there's something about it which looks right, which is this this compassion towards the stranger, the compassion towards the exception, uh, you know, the, the marginalized, which is, is Christian, but not the tyranny of the margin. That's not Christian. That's exactly right. It's really hard to see your problems whenever you're full of pride. And of course, the problem, the problem with a prideful man is that he's always looking down on people. And it's, whenever you're looking down, you can't see that which, which is above you. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's really the, that's the, like the satanic move. Uh, you know, that's it. That's what that's the fall. The fall of, the, of uh, Satan in the story and the fall of Adam and Eve is all about pride. It's all about thinking it, the buck stops at me. Everything, everything resolves into myself and, and then that creates this upside down hierarchy. That's right. That's right. And, and what, what do they say? We shall be like gods. Well, we're going yeah. to set up our own. We'll be like gods and we'll make our own decisions. We'll be our own man. We'll pretend that we weren't created. We'll pretend that, that there's no moral authority above us and we'll live the way that we want to live. And, and, you, and like you mentioned earlier, what they do is they start building walls around themselves. And, and that, that, that happens, happened then. They started covering themselves with, because they were ashamed. And they start building protection on there. Because why? Because they reject the, the, the primary uh, uh, directive of God, which is to fear not. That perfect mm -hmm. love casts out all fear. And whenever you're out of a relationship with God, you have nothing to do but to fear. Yeah. And there's a... What you see in scripture and the, the pattern you could say is that if you imagine that the, the proper alignment or the proper relationship is a union of heaven and earth, right? A union of, uh, in the garden, you can imagine the garden as a mountain and then this place at the top where, or the place that Moses goes at the top of the mountain. And ultimately that comes together in the person of Christ as this union of, of heaven and earth. The modern world manifests itself as extremes. And one of the reasons why people struggle to see that is because they tend to take one of the extremes. They take the, the place into one of the extremes and they only see the other extreme as the, as the bad guy, let's say. And so the, the world of the fall, or the, even the modern world, tends to move from, let's say, extreme freedom and extreme uh, idiosyncrasy into then extreme order and totalitarian moves. And so we see this vacillation in the modern world. Uh, now, we, you know, for a while, we were more on the side of the of the idiosyncrasy and the, the chaos, let's say, but we can, anybody who is attentive can see that the totalitarian move is right on the, is right on the horizon. It's almost already there. And so we're gonna move toward a more kind of control society where everything is managed, everything is controlled, your whole life is, is calculated, is, uh, is accounted for. Um, and so that's the problem is that we just vacillate between these two extremes. That's right. That's right. And so, the, so the, the, the controlling responsibility within the individual is this moral law that the relativists reject. Um, and they, they, I think that they reject it because they don't want, they, they want to set up as their own. They want to be like gods. And so, and so how, do you, how do you convince them that there, that there, is, that there is indeed a moral law that, are, that is within the, that, that maybe not be naturally put there through evolution and the Darwinistic types of premises, but also what was put there by by a creator yeah i mean there's some people that you'll never be able to convince <laughs> people that are possessed are difficult to convince because people become possessed by these ideologies and uh they live through them and they start to actually take the shape of the things that they worship and so when you worship a, a certain ideological position it's almost like it invades your being and then people uh are incapable of seeing anything except for that which is within their blinders. And so, you know, I don't know how to, I don't totally know how to talk to those people, to be honest. I think the, the people that notice the problem, at least, that see that there's something wrong, like there's something off, and that, you know, they notice the fragmentation in society, they notice also this, let's say, totalitarian desire that the state has, and they can see it happen. And I think that to those people, it, then you can speak into that and talk about this idea of, let's say, the incarnational principle, yes. this idea of this possibility of balancing, let's say, the, the order and the potentiality, of balancing the two sides, and that's love, right? And that's how the world exists. It's like it's possible to speak into that. But to be honest, like the, the, those that are, I haven't yet seen a way to talk to those that are completely ideologically 
taken. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think I think one of my favorite conversations I like to have with people that are uh, not believers that are maybe maybe worshipers of the naturalistic approach to 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 morality. Um, I like to talk about the the Latin term ex nihilo no, out of nothing, nothing comes. And so they all, they always like to push the why question back, right? The, the, the question of why is a is a question about time and what precedes it. There's always the, the, the why is always a predecessor uh, to, to, the, to the impact of the why. Yeah. And, and so eventually they got to get back to some sort of, it, whether pre-Big pre Bang, they've got to get back to uh, the concept of uh, some, some morphic uh, type of gravity, gravitational field that pre-existed. But, but before that, you got you to get to something that's not natural, right? The, yeah. the, the, either we believe in the laws of thermodynamics or we don't believe in the laws of thermodynamics. And if you're going to worship science... Hey, maybe you should go ahead and worship some of the basic premises of science. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. So, so they have a they have a hard time getting back to that, and explaining the how to, how out of nothing nothing came, um, mm. as the, as their as the the start for their their natural beliefs. Now, I think also uh, even even if they can even if they they don't have a problem with out of nothing nothing comes, they eventually have to get to the part that there is some sort of natural law at play with within us. Uh, that this moral law. Um, so, so if I if I believe in the the law of gravity and I drop a stone, the stone falls because it has to fall. It has no other options with their fall. But you and me, we have we have an option because we're not under just the natural law. We're under the moral law. We can choose mm. to disobey the moral law. We we each in, inside know that we're supposed to do things because we have something in English, uh, a word called ought. We ought to do something. Yeah. The presence, the very presence of the word ought. Exactly. They can't explain it. <laughs> No, you can't explain that. You can't explain that. I mean, you can't explain it scientifically because it the word ought means that you perceive the good. Now, whether you perceive the good in a a, a twisted way, whether you you're perceiving the wrong good, I can who cares? Like th just the fact that you have a category of the good, that you have a sense that things can be that there's a hierarchy in the world, that there are things that are better than others, that there's a that there's a better something than an other thing. Uh that is really, and I think that as you were saying it, I realized that that has been like my strategy has been something like that is, is to talk about two things, to talk about the, the good and to talk about attention and to talk about how the world is so complex and so multiple that it actually needs something like attention for you to be able to, to notice it. And that attention is value laden. Right. It has to be there. It's not neutral. Noticing something means you attribute value to it. And already you're in a moral law. You're already in a, at least a law of the good and the bad. And then, you know, even in terms of like a, like a good pencil, like a good pencil is not a moral thing, but I can tell, I know what a good pencil is and I know because it has a purpose and I can see the good in it. And, and even a, a rock, like I know what a good rock is if I want to throw it. And I know what a good rock is if I want to build a house with it and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that's really... That has been like my strategy, let's say, to go at, at people and try to help them see that the, the meaning is inevitable, at least meaning. And the idea of the good is inevitable and these hierarchies are inevitable as well. Yes, yes, that's, that's exactly right. So and I, think, I think the naturalists, they like to, they like to use vocabulary to really, to really kind of switch up the tangents. And so I don't know, what, you know when, I, when I first got my driver's license, my mom said, you know, I know you like to help people, but if you ever see someone broken down on the side of the road, don't stop and help them fix the flat tire because we all heard stories about people getting hit on the side of the road by doing that. That's like the one thing you don't do. Call for help for them. Don't do that. And so every single time I, I see someone on the side of the road that has a flat tire, especially a woman uh, that, that maybe can't change the tire by herself, uh, maybe it's an older lady, something like that, there's, there's, there's two instincts that I have. Number one is the instinct to stop and put myself at risk and help her. The second instinct is, to, is just to keep on going, maybe, maybe make a call, maybe not, but it's self-preservation. And so the naturalist would say, well, that's, those are the two moral laws, and it's, it's my relativist uh, idea whether to, whether to choose which one of them. But, but what they don't realize is above those two, or more, two, two instincts is, is a moral law that's judging both your instincts. You know which one you should really do. Now, mm. we may choose not to do it, but there is a judge of, that, of those two instincts, and it's a moral law. And I tell you what, Jonathan, I've never seen a law without a lawmaker. Yeah. Yeah, well, for sure. There's, I mean, in the sense that the only meaning that we know is a meaning that exists through something like person, like that you know, any type of meaning that we can recognize is something like an intelligence. And so, and so 
you know, once you, once you start to see that that's inevitable for that to be like without intelligence, there's, there's just quantum flux or whatever. There's just like possibilities. And so you need these intelligent agents. And so, like you said, that, that if you, if you understand the ramifications of that, then that can actually scale up. And the idea of angels, the idea of higher beings is not at all, doesn't become weird at all. And then scale that up until you reach, right, the highest thing which contains everything in it. Like, so, yeah, that's, you know, we have, we call that God. That's what, that's what it is. And it is a, and it is an intelligence. It's like the infinite intelligence, you could say. That's right. That's right. And I, I think the, I think the primary, uh, I guess hurdle to, to have have some of these conversations with people that are that are maybe not believers, right? You've got you have different steps. You've got atheists, you've got theists, you've got maybe some sort of borderline Christian, and then you got full blown Christian. Um, and, and so they're, they're they're in steps, right? You got to be convinced of the existence of God before you can become a Christian. So so as you as you sort of walk towards theism, it seems like at some point you've got to prove the moral law, and you have to prove maybe the evidence of evil in mankind. Like, that, that, that's a significant hurdle. Maybe not, maybe not that I didn't make a mistake, but maybe someone else made a mistake that there's, that there's evil that exists in the world. Uh, what, are, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, on the evidence of evil, uh, the concept of original sin, and, and, and maybe the, uh, the deplorable nature of, of mankind, uh, especially from your, from your orthodox background? Yeah. Well, from the orthodox perspective, they, they, we don't have the idea of uh, sinful nature. That's something that just never that never landed. It it really comes from Augustine mostly and has its own development through Anselm and, and Western uh, writers. In the Orthodox tradition, it's more this idea of um, that there is always in the world and everything there is like a divine spark. You could say that yes. in order for the world to even exist, it has to be connected to divinity somehow, or else it would just cease to exist. And so God is always sustaining reality through this this point, right? This quality that I talk about, this idea that we talk, the good, let's say the good in that thing for it to even exist is the, the, the point that brings it together. And then the problem that, that happens, the fall, let's say, is that we are, we are meant to look up, right? We're meant to look up. And then once you, when you look up, then all of reality aligns itself properly. But we have a tendency to look down and to focus on the particulars. And then we, we, because we give our attention too much to those things, then we sin. And that's what sin is. It's missing the mark, right? Missing the ultimate mark, you could say. And so it's a, it's a good that's not in the right place. And that's usually what it is. So the idea is that there isn't anything which is evil in itself. Evil doesn't have a, doesn't have a, a positive existence. It's always misplacement of something else. And so it's always like, like sexuality is good. There's nothing wrong with sexuality. It's when you don't aim it in the right direction that it becomes a problem. Uh, you know, your desire to eat is good, but it's when, you, it's when you worship your desire to eat that it becomes a problem. That's right. Um, and so to me, it's, I, I, like I have more of a tendency to help people see the inevitability of the good in the sense that your, 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 the inevitable capacity you have and tendency you have to notice the good. Whether I agree with, whether I think the good that you're pointing to is, is false or it, it's off, like just that capacity. And then noticing, like you said, that you miss that. You miss that mark. And so, so if you're always missing the mark, how can you even recognize, what is it that makes you recognize the good, right? So there's something going on. There's a pattern playing itself out. There's something which is showing you how reality actually works and how it scales up towards the, the, the infinite good. So that tends to be more my... Uh, my uh, the approach that I have, let's say. Okay, okay, and I, I, th I think the I think the Augustinian uh, position was was really a, a differentiator uh, in theology because he, he he attached the the dissemination of sin from Adam to to the present day through blood. He said it was through blood, um, and I think there's a lot of people that maybe maybe reject that in some nature. But we obviously a lot of us I think most of us look around and see that it's obvious that mankind eventually sins. Like we all, yeah. we all make, we all make mistakes, whether in action or deed or, th or thought or intention. Yeah. The, well, the way that at least the Orthodox tend to understand it is that sin brings death. Yes. Right. So imagine, so imagine again, this mountain, this mountain, of the garden with like the top of the mountain as the goal, the place where God meets you. And then when you sin, when you miss that mark, when you worship yourself, it usually starts with worshiping yourself. Uh, then you start to die. 
which means that the elements of you start to break apart because they're supposed to be united under this higher thing. And then they start to break apart, right? It's a, it's a, if a baseball team, which has a goal, which is to play baseball and to win, starts to, starts to think about its own, every player starts to think about their own little thing. Like, uh, I don't know, think about their, whatever it is they want to think about that's not part of their goal, then that team is going to die. It's going to start to fragment and break apart. So if the tin team sins, misses their mark, then they're going to start to break apart. Um, and so the, the idea in the Orthodox tradition is that once you're in the world of death, then the, the, you're in a cycle of sinning. It's hard to avoid it because once you start to break down into your constitutive desires, then those desires start to pull at you. And so it's like all your desires, which are supposed to be aligned under a higher purpose, then they start to like pull you in different directions. Then you start to be ripped apart by your desires. And then it becomes easier to sin because, you know, you've got, you know, a desire to, to, to uh, control other people. You've got this desire, this sexual desire. You've got this desire to get away with things uh, because you think it's going to make you safe. You know, it's like, if I can get away with this lie, then I'm going to be safe. And so I'm going to protect myself. So all of these, this world of death, which is these two extremes that I talked about, this desire to control everything and then this breakdown into chaos, then that, then once you're there, it's like yeah. sin, sin, sin. And it takes like a, it really takes a whole, uh, you know, it, it takes re-putting back in place an ultimate center that we can look onto and that we can model ourselves after and that we can live in to be able to, to get away from that. And that's what, that's what the incarnation is. And that's what the idea of self-sacrifice is in Christianity. It kind of, it breaks down the pattern of sin because all of a sudden the way to reach up is to actually sacrifice those desires that, that are holding you. All the things you think are you, it's like, that's not you. Break that, get rid of that. If you sacrifice that, then you're actually going to become lighter and start to go up the mountain. That's right. That's right. So, yeah. So, and I think, I think a lot of it trying to, trying to escape that, that vicious cycle of, of sin is, is learning how to, how to get out of it, how to really change course. And it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's an accelerant. It, it, it leads you down the wrong path faster and faster. It's like a, it's like a bad drug. And, I think you know you as you as an artist. You know, I think you said you have you have a son, and you know if you're teaching that son how to how to how to draw or how to write for the first time, you're you got your hand on him, and you're you're teaching him how to how to write because you know how to write, and he's not going to learn how to write unless you teach him, and he's not going to intrinsically know how to write, and so that's sort of like how God has to teach us how to how to stop sinning to become better, but the problem is, is in God's nature, He's never had to stop sinning because He's never sinned. He's never had to repent because he's never done anything wrong, and he's never had to to reverse course because he's always been headed in the right the right direction all along because he's perfect, and so and so that's something where it it it, it then directs us to a uh, uh, a bridge and you, and you talked a little bit about the, the coming together between heaven and earth and and sort of this this medium and and uh, Philo Alexandria Philo of Alexandria who was a Hellenistic Jew that lived in Egypt. Uh, sort of around the time of Christ, maybe about 30 years older than Christ, um, he started talking about this uh, in advance. And, and so this is, a, this is akin to a secularized Jew, kind of a relativist there, that uh, he, he said that there, there must be a medium to bridge heaven and earth. And he said, uh, he said that, that that medium must also be the glue. Now, what hmm. does that sound like? What it sounds like, it sounds like Hebrews 1.3 that he yeah. that Christ Jesus upholds the universe with the word by the word of his yeah. power. That just a word from a, from this God man Jesus Christ is what holds upholds it. So he's not only the mediator, but he's also the kind of the glue guy that, that keeps everything everything working there. And uh, that's that seems to be like the, the the obvious conclusion that even the philosophers before they even knew about Jesus would say that hey, it's going to take some sort of mediator like you like you alluded to before. Yeah, and so those mediators existed relatively before you know you can see the prophet playing that role this the the the, sacri- the person who's leading the sacrifices in the temple in the tabernacle uh and then you can if you look at ancient myth- mythological figures they'll have the idea that the king plays that role let's say the king that's why they would say like the king is a god because the king would be or a half god sometimes they would say and because he played that kind of role as a mediator um, but there is, there is always the problem of, the, of these relative mediators because they would always, 
they would always enter into uh, these cycles of, of sacrifice and then also these cycles of scapegoating where they would have to end up going to war ultimately. Like it would always have to be a, a way to, to have an other that you demonize and that you, you, you want to, to attack, to destroy or, you know, to, and then, so Christ really gives us a solution to that whole pattern. You know, and like I said, it ends up being this surprising story of self-sacrifice, uh, which ends up being the, re the reality, the key to reality. And once you see it, like once you understand that something like sacrifice is the origin of reality, reality is based on sacrifice. Uh, and that's why in Revelation, for example, it talks about, you know, the lamb that was sacrificed before the foundation of the world. You think, okay, what's going on here? Uh, and it's this idea that the highest thing you can do is give yourself to something higher. And this is like almost like a technical thing that I'm saying. It's not like, it's not just some emotional thing. It's like the, the highest thing like that a part of a chair can do is, part is give itself to its higher goal, which is to be a chair. Yes. If it doesn't, then it's going to fall apart and you won't be able to sit on it. Yes. And it's the same for uh, a family. The highest thing the members of a family can do is give themselves to the communion and the love that is binding the, binding the family together. And so you realize that, wait, sacrifice is the, core, is the way reality works. And self-sacrifice is the way that we actually bind ourselves to each other into something higher than us. And so the, the image of Christ as not the scapegoat that sacrificed to bind the community, not the king that is risen up above to bind the community, but both at the same time, and in a way that actually spans the whole universal story, it's like, there's no story to tell after that story. It's like, that's the story. I keep telling people that there's no story to tell after the story of Christ. He, he, he kind of solves all the puzzles. It's pretty astounding, actually. Yeah, that, that's right. That's right. And, and the, 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 fa the fact that it always takes blood to atone for sin, whether in the Christian tradition, the, the Jewish tradition, or other traditions, even in the pagan uh, traditions, it always takes blood. And it's not, it's not because it's a traditional thing. It's because it's truth. Some, somehow humankind knew that it was truth that takes blood to atone for sin. Now, the problem, like, like we talked about a second ago, was that we didn't know how to repent because and we couldn't have God teach us because God had never repented. Um, and, and it requires blood, but God couldn't die and, and provide that blood for us. And then, and then so Lewis, Lewis gives this, this epic statement. And this is, this is, in my opinion, Jonathan, the, the most beautiful statement outside of Scripture. He says, supposing God became a man... And his nature was amalgamated with our nature. He could suffer and die because he was a man, but he could do it perfectly because he was God. Then that person yeah. could help us. Yeah. And, and a lot of atheists w who would listen to this would think that, okay, this is just magic thinking. You think that blood, you need blood to, 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 to cover the world. Like you need blood to, to save uh, unity. Like, what are you talking about? This is insane. And, and despite that, we live in the shadow of World War II where a churning of blood of millions of people were sacrificed in order to create unity within the West. And so if you don't believe that you need blood to unite people, it's like, if you deny that, then you've got, you, not only is it going to happen again, but it's going to happen at levels, gulag levels, you know, concentration camp levels of, of human sacrifice in order to reach. It's like, do you think that the bombs that they dropped on Japan were not a human sacrifice? They were a human sacrifice. They said, and that's even if you listen to just secular historians, that's how they present it to us. They say, these people needed to be sacrificed in order to stop the suffering. We need to kill these innocent people so that the, the war will stop. And now we're going to bind together and we won't fight anymore. And we've been living in, on the covenant of World War II for, for the past few generations, it's been binding us together, the, 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 the blood that was poured in that war. And so people who think that this is just mythological thinking and that it doesn't pan out in reality, we need to take a better look at what's going on. And the same thing like right now with abortion, it's the same thing. Yes. The, 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 the people believe that abortion is a solution to their problems. They think that they need to sacrifice a life in order to have a better one. What do you think they were doing in the past when they were killing uh, humans, they were making human sacrifice? They were saying, if we kill this person, then I, my life will, get, will be better. And we think that the same thing today. We think that we, we will sacrifice this, this, this person so that my life will then not have any problems. Like I will solve my problem by sacrificing this person. And so this is, this is a reality that we live with. 
That's that's right. That's right. And so I, I, I think I think you you see this, and you set it, you set up the argument earlier, where I mean you you prove the existence of the evil through the, the existence of the Nazi concentration camps, uh, the the erosion of a bomb. Um, you, you know, even look and see what see what happened in Stalin's Russia. You see what's happening in China right now with the Uyghurs. Uh, yeah. There there is it's it's very evident that that evil exists in the world of evil, and and so and so some of the philosophers that may be on the secular side of things. Uh, might say, well, how do we get evil from a good God? And, uh, and, and, and you, you said, said up earlier that that evil is only kind of bastardized goodness. It's intellect that takes a little bit of a selfish twist. And going back to that, that, that garden scene where we shall be like gods, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a twist on we're made in the image of God. No, we shall be like gods. It's, it's a little bit of a twist on goodness and holiness that, that, that then becomes self, self-pleasing. Yeah, exactly. And there's a and there's a mystery, let's say, kind of in the whole story. It's hard to fully pierce it, but we can kind of see how God changes death into glory. Uh, we see that on the cross. We see it in things like the crown of thorns. And we see it, for example, even in the New Jerusalem, this process of death, which is the the, the, this, you know, this moving out and then building walls and building layers gets transformed into something different in the end. And so there is this idea that, let's say, in the totality of things, in the, the totality of everything, uh, that this process, even of evil and death, gets flipped and gets changed into something which ends up, you know, worshiping the, the creator anyways. Yeah. Uh, a, a, little, a, little while, a little while ago, you mentioned the phrase, before the foundation of the world, I think. And so, can you can you set up what what actually was happening before the foundation of the world? What what, what was what was going on there? What, there was, what, what I mean, there was nothing intuit? going on. I don't know. Like the, the the you mean there was nothing happening before the before the beginning of time. The beginning of time is the beginning of time. Uh, that's kind of that's how I see it. When I when I when it talks about before the foundation of the world, you could say it, understand it as uh, in eternity and in eternity in the sense of outside of time or in that space where all the totality of time exists in a moment or in a in a eternity is not just like before the creation of the world then there was all this time that never stops going going backwards that's not the church fathers never understood eternity that way uh, they understand eternity rather as the source of time or let's say that that kind of infinite moment out of which all time comes. And so you could say that the Lamb of God is eternally sacrificed, right? And that, it, so it's not like it happened in, in a moment. Uh, and that's why, like, even some of the church fathers will say things that sound crazy to most people that, like, the, the crucifixion happened in eternity. And so it's like, it, yes, it manifested in the world, but it's an eternal event in the sense that there's a mystery in the crucifixion which is actually revealing to us how reality itself works from the, its very source in terms of uh, in terms of this 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 uh, this pattern of being that I talk about, um, and so I don't think that there was anything there wasn't anything like happening before uh, before creation. It's just all creation flows out of this eternal eternal uh, spark or this eternal moment. Or I don't. There's the, no words to talk about it because it's it's outside of time. It's outside yeah. of category. So. Yeah. But I, I think I think you I think you've got this, uh, and I, I apologize I wasn't clear. So you've got this you got the Trinity that preexisted the foundation of the of the world, and there was there was it had to be something happening there. And I I think you're I think you're right. The time the concept of time is really misconstrued, and this is probably one of the arguments that, that you know like I said earlier, Christ was uh, 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 upholding the uh, the very universe of the world by the word of his power. Well, how was he doing that while he was here on earth as a baby? Um, and, and so, you know, some people might argue like that that's a non sequitur, that that doesn't make a lot of sense. But, 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 but God is outside of time. He's looking down in time. And, and, and the, the church fathers would say that uh, God is imminent. He's imminent. So yesterday, today, and forever are the same, are the same for him. He, he is very much as present now that he was yesterday than he is right now in the future that that it's, it's, like, it's like an author who's writing a story that gets up and wants to think about the storyline a little more. He can change the storyline. He can go back and erase. He can add more in the future. But, as, but time stops in the story when he gets up uh, from, mm-hmm. from the desk and stops writing. And, and God's, God's imminence, where he can evoke his authority on what happened a thousand years ago right now, and he's very much present right now just as he was yesterday and he will be tomorrow, uh, that, that's all pent up in the, magn- the majesty and the glory of God 
that, and, and the omnipotence and the omniscience of God, that he, he can effectuate change across the entire horizon of, of time at any moment at his, at his, at his pleasure. Right, and, and so the idea would be that God is outside of time, but time is contained, how can I say this, that all of, create, all of the world exists in God, like it's not outside of God. It's, that, that doesn't make any sense in terms of, uh, there is no outside to God. And so we're, the, the God, everything is within, is in God in the sense, but we're not God in the pantheistic sense, but. Yes. <coughs> sorry, we're, we're, the creation, creation is, is in God. And so like you said, that, that time is an element of that. And linearity of time is also contained in, in that, in the totality, let's say. And so the, the idea that once, you, once Christ is incarnated, then all of a sudden you realize that this was the story all along, or that this was there from the beginning, that all of the sacrifices, all of the stuff described in the Old Testament is actually always an element of Christ, which is kind of culminating into this one moment that happens in the world, but is then shows you that it's this is the key to everything else. It's the key to to all of reality from the beginning. Um, so that's kind of the mystery. Those things, these things are hard to talk about because we are obviously beings beings that are in time. We have this this inkling of something more, but it's hard to it's hard to pierce that mystery. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's really like I'll, I'll use the I know I know you're an artist. So I'll use this as a, as an example. Is that is that if we're if we're in a in a one uh, a one dimensional type of being, our thought is surrounded one dimensions. Uh, you know, I can understand a straight line on a piece of paper, but if you start telling me that you can put four lines together, and you can make a square, you make a two dimensional figure. I don't I don't believe you. I don't believe you because it just doesn't make any sense to me. Now, hmm. if you start telling me that you can take these four these four lines, these two dimensions, and then you can then create. Um, you can use six of those, and you can make a cube in three dimensions. And I'm in a one dimensionally minded person, I, I, I don't grasp that at all. And, mm. that's, and that's, that's, that's an issue whenever we're trying to explain the higher medium, the richer medium, by the poor medium. And that's, and that's our problem as, as human beings. We're trying to explain something that's in three dimensions, and we're, we're one-dimensional thinkers. Yeah. And so the, the fathers, they, they, their solution to that is to have kind of two moves that we sometimes call the the apophatic move and the, the cataphatic move, which is that on the one hand, we are always reminding people that the, the, realities, the, the realities of the infinite are something that we can't talk about. Like everything we say about God is, is false, right? Everything we say about him is, is ultimately not reaching up to him. It's always, uh, it's always somehow wrong. Uh, but at the same time, because all of reality is contained by God and all of reality flows out of him, therefore, at, at the same time, everything in the world is manifesting God. And so we can participate in, in the life of God if we are attentive, if we, and especially if we love each other, because as you love one another, then things start to clump together and you start to see these higher patterns, right? And so you can imagine that if you're this, this one dimensional point, and then you see this other one dimensional point, and that you join yourselves in love, then all of a sudden you've got two dimensions, you know? And so, I mean, it's just an analogy, but you can, it can help you understand how it is possible to kind of rise up, as St. Paul talks about, to, to be fit, you know, to rise up as a body into the head as we participate in this, in this cosmic body of Christ. Yeah, yeah, and I think I, think I wanna, I wanna uh, go on a little bit of a wormhole with you on that, on that concept of love before the creation of the world. In that, in that Saint Victor, I mean uh, Richard of Saint Victor, I believe it was that uh, that that used the analogy that uh, when talking about the Trinity, uh, you know, it's if you look at the world, the world religions, look at the, look at the Hindus, uh, look at the Jews, look at the look at the Muslims, look at the Christians. We all believe that at its essence, God is love. We all, I mean, we, we might believe in a in a, in a polytheistic God, uh, on some some of those groups, but we believe God is love at its very very core, and. The reason why we know God is love is because we, we love, that we, 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 we reflect his love. And the reason why we know, and this is, this is what Richard said, Richard St. Victor said, he said that, that if, if, you had a, if you had a God in singularity, a one-person God, uh, before the creation of the world, he would have no one to love. So therefore, he could not have been love he could, from the very, very beginning. So it means he would have changed, which means he would not have been God. Now, if you had yeah. a two-person God before the creation of the world, those two people within God, within the Godhead, could love each other, but it would be sort of a selfish love 
because it's a it's a love that's focused on on each like other. A mirror, yeah. And yeah. but but then he said he said that the reason why we know God has to be a, have been a Trinity is because God created love for a secondary purpose and for a higher purpose, and that's so he that we could share love, and that you could mm -hmm. only have a shareable love if you have a Trinity. That, that it's able to share love between party to party to party. And, and Tozer, I think, talks about this eternal dance of love that, yeah. that, uh, that existed before the creation of the world, and, the, and that God invites us to join him in this eternal dance, and that's really what the, the becoming a new man becomes, is that he invites us into this love, this love that existed before the, before the creation of the world, and offers us his, his love, the highest type of love, uh, that, that we're only reflecting very, 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 very weakly right now. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there is a t there's a temptation right now to, to, for people to go back to Gnosticism. And it is really this, this uh, problem of misunderstanding the Trinity and misunderstanding this idea that love is at the core of how reality works. Um, and you can see it in, the, in all the kind of transhumanist moves, all these, these, uh, these desires to upload, you know, like the idea of uploading your mind or all these, these tendencies uh, have this Gnostic vision, which is that somehow the world is corrupt in itself. And so, you know, you have the divine monad. It's easier to see. It's easy to see. It's a more natural tendency to see the, the divine monad, let's say the unity that brings everything together. Uh, but then there's a problem of how that connects to multiplicity. Yeah. So people who don't believe in uh, a form of trinity, they'll tend to see multiplicity as fallen in itself, right? as the world as being tainted in itself, as being poisoned at the very outset. So even as the created world itself is evil, you know, so you see that in Gnosticism and a lot of that type of thinking. Whereas the Trinity, because it contains, like you said, not just duality, but three, which is the root of multiplicity, right? Which is the root of this dynamic relationship. Then it is becomes an image of how the world exists. And it helps us to see that the world is good and that it exists through this love that we can participate in and, you know, uh, yeah. And then be called into the life of God. That's right. That's right. And, th and that, that's an important thing about, about being, being an artist. You know, you've, you can be a sculptor, you can be a drawer, you can be a musician as well. And, uh, you, you know, you may, I think uh, we talked about King David a second ago, or, we, or at least we intuited about King David. He was a great, great musician. And what you see, what we see in the context of music, are you, are you, are you a musician by any chance? Not at all. No, I'm okay. not. Okay. Okay. I wish, so, but no. Okay. So, so, I studied uh, I, I studied music in college. So what what I what I found out that is that music is based in trinities. It's a trinity of trinities, and this is kind of neat. So if you listen to almost any song that that has had um, you know any any relevance in, in the last thousand years, you'll see a basis of three chords. Generally, it's like a mm -hmm. it's like a one four five chord, whether it's modern day or now. There'll be some derivatives of that. There'll be some extra notes. There'll be some some minor chords put in there. But but the basis of it is three chords. Now if you look. If you look at the structure of, of, of chords, it's got three notes in it. So you've got uh, most of the song, thousands of years, three chords. Now, this is, this, is, this is Western music, made up of three notes. Now, if you measure the variance in between those three notes, what you see is they're in thirds. Mm -hmm. So even, even at, the, at the inkling of arts and the way that he made us to function and, and made us to worship him, he has a trinity of trinities at play in the way that we like to worship. Uh, and so that, that's just kind of a, a sign of how, how God builds that trinity within, within us. And, and uh, you know, you, you, go back, you go back to the modulation between or the transposition between uh, the, the line, the square, and the cube, and it should not surprise you that a cube is one, is one figure. It might have six sides, but it's one figure. It might have three dimensions, mm. but it's one figure. And that's, that's like the three-person God. That's like the three-person mm -hmm. God. And so I see people that are very, very smart throw out the concept of a, of a trinity because they're not thinking about a simple cube. I mean, or something very, very simplistic like that. They don't see how one can equal three. Yeah, and they, it, it's also, like, I, like, like you, you're saying, is that it, they don't understand that the problem of multiplicity is a real problem and that if you, if you don't have a way to deal with it, it's going to haunt you in terms of, in terms of Gnosticism and in terms of seeing the world as fallen, all of this is gonna, is gonna happen. And so, you know, you could say that deism and atheism lead to this weird transhumanist uh, way that we think now that, you know, reality is somehow debased and that, you know, 
this idea of the mind, you know, the ghost in the sh the ghost in the shell type of thinking, whereas like this idea of a spirit and then this body that we could leave or transcend, all of this is based on this mistake, this basic error that we don't understand why you know why the root of reality is a trinity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they and they they like to they like to get in this derivative conversation about uh, well, I believe that if God was real, it would be a simpler to understand or it would be cleaner, or it would be more streamlined, or it would have this, this, uh, this attribute or this attribute. But what we're talking about is we're not in the business of making up religions. We're talking about truth here, and truth has yeah. some complexity to it. You know, there, you, know you, you talked about the, 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 pagan, the pagan religions and, and a little bit what's happened through, um, you know, you, I think you talked a little bit about, uh, um, about uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Greek the Greek gods and so forth and all and all mm -hmm. the all the stories throughout uh, mythology is that you know yeah there's myths that that happen and myths that kind of echo what the truth is they reflect it a little bit but uh, it's possible that there would be a, a true myth and that's what we're talking about we're exploring the op the option that there could have been a true myth we're we're exploring the option that hey we're not going to invent religions we're going to take truth for what it is no matter how complex it is. And we're going to try to understand it. We're, we're in the lower medium, but we're trying to high, understand a richer medium. Yeah, I mean, the, the, this idea that somehow would be more streamlined and more simple is, is hilarious because, uh, you know, the, the, the scientists, the atheists don't even understand emergence. They don't even understand how any multiplicity joins into one. They don't understand how anything that has parts can also be one at the same time. They don't, they can't explain that. They just have magical words that they use and they talk about emergent qualities as if that tells you how that works. And so it's like, if you don't, if you can't see, if you can't even understand how any multiplicity exists as one, then please don't talk about the Trinity because it's like, you're, you're not, you're not, you don't, you're not qualified to judge that. You know, if you can't even at the ba most basic level, are able to understand this emergence, let's say. So. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's and it's a little bit, it's a little bit like, and I'll, I'll use a, I'll use an artist uh, uh, example. I, I don't know if you remember Rembrandt's The Sea of Galilee that was stolen back in 1990 uh, from that museum, and it's it's the it's Rembrandt's only seascape. It's a story about Jesus is on a boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. There's a storm raging and everything, and there's a hint of yellow and a little bit of maybe purple in there. And it's it's the other half of the most most of the pictures is a little bit of dark, and it's may, maybe a maybe a lightning strike, something like that, has, has illuminated a little bit of the picture. And, and 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 if if I was inventing something and I want it to be simple, what I would say is I I only want the two pretty parts of that picture. I only want the prettiest part, which would be the the yellow, the little hint of yellow. So I what I'm saying is I want to I want a canvas that's just one color, just yellow. That's just yellow, and I think that would be beautiful if, if I'm inventing religions. Now, if I'm looking hmm. for the truth, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for texture. I'm looking for complexity. I'm looking for something that's attached to reality. And it's just like we wouldn't want a canvas full of yellow. We want something that, that reflects reality, that it actually is something that's multimodal, multidimensional, something that is, is something that is from, from beyond nature, striking down into nature, uh, which was the coming and the incarnation of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... And then once you, but then once you, let's say once you attend to that mystery, like once you take the time and you attend to it, then all of a sudden it does start to lay itself out. And it, it, it's not a, it's not an arbitrary thing that you believe. I don't know why it, it actually starts to reveal itself. And then you start to see how it is that it's limitless in terms of what it can offer you, you know, like especially the story of Christ, my goodness, that story, you know, I, you know, we, you know, we've all been living it with it for, since we were born and, you know, I think about that story every day and then I'm surprised and once in a while where I'm like, wait, I didn't, I've never noticed that. How is it that I've never noticed that? And then it opens up an aspect of, of Christ or I'm reading the Old Testament and I'm reading some strange story and I'm like, why is this story there? Why is it so weird? You know, why are these weird stories and judges? And then there's something of Christ which kind of flickers and then you realize, oh, this is what it's talking about. Or, this is what it's manifesting to me. Um, and so it is a, like there is this also this joyful exploration of seeing reality kind of appear to you. And then once you see that, then, like I said, you look back at reality at, at like everyday life and you think, hey, these same patterns are there too. Like this, this story is the, you know, the story of death and resurrection. It's there every time I go to bed and get up in the morning. It's like 
you know, every time the sun goes down and comes up, it's telling that story. Uh, and so the fact that you find it strange that it would culminate into this cosmic vision of a, of a death and resurrection, which would encompass all of reality. It's like, okay, I, I understand why you might find that strange, but it's still everywhere. Like it's still everywhere. Every time the, 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 the leaves come back up after winter, every time, you know, all of, all of this is, is just a pattern of reality. And it just culminates into this one story. So that's right. That's right. It, it, it's it's kind of it's kind of funny how an artist lets his handiwork be known as creation, where you see mm. like like you mentioned the weeds coming back up, up after winter that you see this process of death and rebirth, death and rebirth, death and rebirth. Well, I mean, what what more do you need? I mean, do you need an actual <laughs> signature on the canvas that says God <laughs> created this? I mean, what what more can you possibly need? You know, you're uh, you know an artist like yourself. I mean, you. You probably don't need the signature on the canvas. You can you can tell whose handiwork is whose handiwork, and it's it. But it's you're, you're, it's interesting because I've noticed that uh, a lot of artists right now that are attentive are able to like I've noticed like musicians, for example, like you said, are more easily capable of coming to believe in God and in and in Christianity because they're just naturally prone to noticing patterns. Like they're naturally prone to seeing how the world kind of has this, this pattern to it. And so they tend to be uh, more easily uh, convinced, let's say. Whereas the, the, the worst are the rationalists. Like they're the worst because they also have this trust in their own reason and their trust in their own capacity. And so because of that, it's harder to break that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's, a, there's a reason why David, I think in, in the verse, the third verse of all the Psalms says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's mm. not intellect, it's not IQ, it's not how many degrees you have. It's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Well, maybe that's something to think about by the, by the guy that was the greatest king in all of Jewish history that also gave birth to the wisest man in all of human history, Solomon. Maybe it's worth, maybe it's worth considered, I don't know. <laughs> no, but you're, you're right. And there's also something about that uh, that it also informs the way, like I, like I keep saying, it also informs the way that the world works, which is that, there are things that unite us into one, yes. right? And you need to fear that because if you don't, like even your family, let's say your family has, has an aspect of it which unites it and you need to have a certain, don't touch that fear of whatever it is that unites your family together because if you don't, if you act with sacrilege and you act in a way to disrespect that, that aspect which unites you, you're going to be surprised to find your whole life in chaos and you're going to be surprised to find that everything is break is breaking around you, you know. And it's the same even as a country. Like a country has certain things that are sacred, which binds them. And you need to fear that. You need to be careful. Don't touch that. Don't yeah. touch that without thinking, without understanding what it's going to do to the world, because it is going to bring about death if you if you don't fear the things that bind you. And that ultimately culminates into the fear of God, the God Himself. That's right. That's right. It's 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 reverence for the holy, right? I mean, it's mm. it's it's that I've got to realize that my com my fellow man is something holy, someone that's made in the image of God, someone that uh, is not a mortal. It, it, you know, we're 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 all mortals. We're all walking around. Uh, you know, nation, nation civilizations, uh, those are mortal. Uh, and mm. and I think Lewis says that that their life to ours is like like that of a gnat. Uh, but it's mm. mortals that you that you joke with, you snub, you talk to, and you marry. And, uh, and that's the highest form of, of holiness that, we're, that we encounter face-to-face -face as, as our, as our fellow, fellow human being because they're made in the image of God. Hmm. Yeah, and even that, like even the image of God in your fellow man is something you have to fear. Like you have to tiptoe around and you have to be careful not to step on that because, uh, you know, because it doesn't take long before people become beasts and we treat them like beasts. You know, it doesn't, there are not a lot of steps between one and the other. That's right. That's right. So, so I, th I, th I think you, I think you spoke earlier about the, the about the concept or the other reality that Christ is the ultimate symbol of who God is. You know, Christ came. Everything, everything that we saw to Jesus, His love for humanity, love for the poor, the 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 love for life, uh, his his ability to be able to tell stories and, and capture audiences. That tells us evidence of God. Like everything Jesus was, God is. Uh, God the Father is, and so and so being made in the image of God, we're we're also maybe a, maybe once more removed. Uh, we're not as close as close to God, God the Father, as Jesus is, uh, but we are made in His image, and so we're sim we're symbolic of who God is, some some way. 
Uh, would yeah. you would you speak for a second about the about the symbolism, the the responsibility, the the, the imago, imago Dei of, of of what it means to be made in the image of God? Well, one of the things that you see in Scripture in Genesis is that uh, God, for example, puts Adam in the garden, right? Tells him to be a gardener, and so tells him to tend to creation. Uh, he he also says to multiply and dominate the earth. Uh, they, I use the word dominate explicitly because they don't tend to translate it that way, but it has this sense of kind of dominating, yes. uh, but not in a bad sense, but in the sense of spreading the word, right? So you receive the word from heaven and you spread the word out and you, you bring order out of chaos in the same way that God, that God did at the outset. Uh, and then we also see Adam naming the animals, which is this kind of participative role that we have. And so the idea is that the things we put out there, even in terms of meaning, in terms of images, in terms of story, all of these, these images that we, that we speak into the world, they have an effect. They either lead the, word, the world towards the goal, they lead the, wor the world towards the mountain and going up the mountain, or they lead the world away from it and they lead it towards more death and more fragmentation. And so, so we have a, a real responsibility to, to participate in that. And there's a sense in which, and this is something that Jordan Peterson actually encapsulates very well, is that if you lie, you're, you will destroy reality. The more you lie, the more you destroy the world. It happens at a small scale, but this small scale has reverberations and it has, you know, because you're connected to people around you, the effect of your sin is going to be felt. Like you think that you're sinning in secret sometimes, but it, it always has an effect on reality because you're not isolated. Even if you do something in secret, you take that secret out into the community that you're in. Whether it even be in the way you look at people and the way you, 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 just these subtle ways that you act, you're taking that there and you're actually participating in either bringing the world into cohesion, into love or, or breaking it apart. And we all have a, a role to play um, and we all act as the agents of God in the world, you could say. Um, and we have the capacity to either to either to either really bring things towards him or to bring it bring things more towards death. That's right. That's right. It, it's like, it's like in a war. You're either advancing or retreating. If you're staying still, you're retreating. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and, and so and so we we have that we have that need. And I, I think you know we we talked about Adam. It seems like the the pre Adam the pre fall the relationship where God was actually walking around in the garden having conversations with God, with Adam and Eve like that's the goal. Uh, it, the, the, the fact that Eden was perfect naturally wasn't why it was Eden. It was Eden because it had the presence of God. I mean, that, that's also how I would define heaven. Heaven is, is, the, is the imminent presence of God that's, that's realized. There's no need for faith because God is face to face with you. He's there. Yeah. He's evoking his power. He's evoking his will. He's evoking his, his glory. And he's spreading that, that glory directly to you, uh, just, like, just like two men would, would talk and probably closer to that. And and so we're, I, th I think we're trying to get back to Eden. I think that's, that, that's maybe, maybe one of the, one of the hopes. And, and so when we look yeah, at, definitely. yeah, and I, I think when we look, when we look at Romans five, again, that's the, that's the original sin chapter. If you look at it from a little bit different, different stand, it, it, you've got this federal head that is Adam. Uh, you know, he taught us how to sin and we're, and we're, we all just happen to sin. What, what, how that happened, you know, we can agree to disagree on or, or, or agree to disagree with Augustine on how that happens. But what we also see is this hope. There's this dramatic hope that somehow this this Emmanuel Day, this 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 glory of God, this this this, this being like that we are, they're creating the image of God, can be restored to that. And Christ is our federal head that then offers us redemption and propitiation, and offers us this ability to be able to restore the glory, be restored to to relationship with the one true living God. And 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 that's how we. I think that's really how we get restored back to the full image of God. In that we're 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 only mirrors, like we've spoken about a couple of times. We're only mirrors, mirrors, and depending on our cleanliness, that's how that's how much we're reflecting the image and the glory of God. The dirtier you are, the, dirtier, the dirtier we are, the more that that image will be refracted and, and broken about and, and be not not visible. But if God purifies us, His image is shining on us, and, and the rest of the world will see will see His glory. Um, yeah, and and it and it's and once again, it's like people we'll often hear this and think that we're falling into arbitrary religious speak, but that's, that's really, once again, how 
that really once again how things work, how reality works, that is that if you yourself are a slave to all this multiplicity inside you, that you're a slave to these different passions, to your different desires, to these different obsessions, then that's what's going to manifest in the world. You're not going to be this mirror of love and of communion that we're meant to be. But if you're able to free yourself, you know, in prayer, in, you know, through, through the prayers of people around you, through this, this, this communion of love, then, you're, then slowly you're going to start to shine. You're actually going to start to, to, to shine. And I, I hope that some, a few people in their lives have had the chance to meet someone like that, to meet someone who is, who is bright, to meet someone who when you meet them, there's this transparent, uh, just open, you know, truth and love in their eyes and the way they look at you and the way they treat you. There isn't this shiftiness, there isn't this hiding, there isn't this concealing, but rather this just this presence that they're with you. And when you encounter that in a person and you see, uh, you get a glimpse of what's possible, right, of how we can actually exist as human beings. And you, you think like, if that person is even just you know, it's like one tenth of what we see when we when we, we when we read the story of Christ. Like you can understand what how the the magnet the, like the magnitude of what he was and how people were so attracted and repulsed and frustrated and 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 you know so because that type of person is also dangerous, right? Because some people will be will be will get angry. Like if you meet someone that has this open love, they'll just like their reaction will be this furor because they can't stand to see this light. It's like it's a it's burning them, you know. Um and so that's exactly right. Like if we're able to free ourselves from these this mul these multiplicity of passions and live in love, then 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 we will shine and we will become anchors for the world and the world will start to to live again. That's right. That's right. And, th and that's one of the odd things that, that the gospel offers us, this the ability. You, you mentioned specifically luminosity, that, that someone actually shines, uh, and that, that's an aspect of, of glory. So God shares His glory with us. And, and glory, glory is really twofold. So you have this luminosity, this brilliance, this, this shining, and uh, you also have this other element of glory that, that, that seems to be uh, fame or, or appreciation or some, some sort of, uh, of glory that seems a little bit... Uh, paganistic in, in its in its approach, and and then, and then we go back and we read um, uh, re, we read Paul, and he says that those who love God will be known by God. Those who love God will be known by God. He says that there will be fame. That that if we love God, we'll get fame with the only person that really really matters, and it's God. Mm. And and it's it's a very it's very very much akin to what you'd read in Revelation. Uh, where, where the ultimate goal of, of a man is to hear from his maker, well done, good and faithful servant. And, if, yeah. and if, we, if we remember, take, a, take another uh, Louisian type of, type of uh, thought, in that if you remember that, that Christ says that we have to come to him like little children. Uh, he, said, he said specifically, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. That the, mm -hmm. that, the, that the imminent reign of God belongs to little kids, and that if we want to come to Him, we've got to, we've got to become like children. And there's nothing more pure, there's nothing more lovely in a good child than for Him to want to hear His Father say, well done. Mm -hmm. And there's something about that, this idea of glory that can really help people get a sense of what this Christianity is about, uh, which is that the same things, so there's a relationship between glory and death. It's like one actually becomes the other. And you see that in the garden, this idea that, you know, the nakedness of Adam, which is often described by the church fathers as the, as the, the garments of light or the garments of glory, you know, were transmuted into the garments of skin and these coarse kind of dark garments. And so let's say you uh, help the poor or you help the, someone who's sick or you help someone in need. And if you do that by offering that up to God, then it does become your glory. And it actually will be your glory. But if you take it on yourself and you try to shine on the world, you know, through the pride of whatever it is you've done, then it becomes your death. So the, actually the same event, the same thing, the same gesture, the same action can be for your death or for your glory, depending on in which, in which way it's directed. That's, that, that's right. That's right. I think, I think Tozer uses that line. It's not what you do that makes a man holy. It's why you do it. It's the intention. God judges the thoughts and the intentions of the, of the heart. I, it, that, that, that's what the purpose of the Word of God is. It, it, it penetrates the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the actions of the heart. 
And, and, and that's, that's the scary thing. That is the thing that's terrifying, is that, that one day we might look to see up to, up to the sky and see, see the entire world melting around us and, see, and seeing the descending of this, this omniscient, om, omnipresent Jesus Christ who upholds the universe with the world's power coming down to judge us and he can see straight through our souls. Yeah, and, exactly. And all the things that I've done that, to make myself look good are going to be nothing, you know. That's right. He sees. Yeah, he sees. He sees the why. That's that's for sure. So, so in your, so in your, uh, your belief system, uh, you have this concept of theosis. Tell, tell. I, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm yeah. wrong. No, no. This is that. This is the. So in the, in the idea of the the church fathers, you'd say you find it already in Saint Irenaeus, who says uh, the logos of God uh, became man, so that man could become God, and you find it in Saint Athanasius, who kind of clipped it and made it more aesthetic and said, you know, God became man so that man could become God. Um, it's the idea that the purpose of creation, like that's why God created the world in the first place, was actually to bring his creation into his life in this, in this true transformation and this true uh, participation in his life. And so that's what we're actually called to do. And so the idea is that salvation in the in the way that a lot of more superficial ways of understanding salvation as this thing of like, you know, I believe in this or I do this and then I die and then I got my ticket, then I go to heaven. Uh, that in, in the Orthodox way of thinking, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't actually mean anything. And so the idea is that salvation is the transformation of the person. And so to be saved is to be transformed. And what you're transformed into is into God. Uh, not in the sense that your nature changes, like that, that you become by nature God, but that as a creature, you become translucent and transparent and your whole being is, is transformed into this love and into this participation in the life of God. Um, but it's an actual transformation of the person. And so it's not like, uh, it actually has to happen. And it's, so, and, and it's not about doing good or doing bad in a, in a moral sense, although that will kind of, uh, seep down from, from the transformation. It really is uh, being transformed into a, a being that is free from the passions and becomes a, 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 a let's say, a, a being of light that is full of the, of the love of God and then, and then lives in that joy and in that, that, that transformation. So, it's, so I, it, that's probably the best way to explain it. So it sounds a little bit like the Wesleyan Arminian tradition that would that would use the, sort of the same thing as, as sanctification, the definition of sanctification, in that I don't feel the 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 pool of sin. I feel I feel like I'm I've moved to another level there. Uh, and and some some uh, belief systems within the Arminian tradition would say that they're that they've actually re reached perfection. Um, is is it something is it something like that, or or, yeah. or does it, or do you actually lose the personality? And your personality is actually absorbed into the ocean of God. No, that's that's for sure. That doesn't happen. And the Trinity helps you understand why that doesn't happen. So there isn't this sense that you find in um, Hindu uh, mysticism, for example, where this idea that it's a drop that goes back into the ocean, where you actually completely disappear. Uh, there's a sense in which because there's a sense in which multiplicity is good. Right when God creates the world. He says all the time, this is good, this is good, this is good. There's a sense in which multiplicity actually participates in, in the life of God. Like that, that, that's actually part of what God wanted from the beginning is to have this, this kind of overflowing of himself into creation, but then this bringing in in love of this creation into himself. And so there isn't this idea that, that uh, being united with God or being divinized is a, um, is a form of, of annihilation of the of the person. It's rather this. Uh, it's rather is the fullness of what you were meant to be, and the fullness of the of the person. So it it it's a, and it and it's like you'll see yourself as you know fully as the member of the body of Christ, but not just see yourself, but you'll be you'll be transformed into that. This is bo this is before death. Sorry. This, yeah, even before this, you die. This is you're called to 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 that right away. Like you're. The kingdom of God is is within you. The kingdom of God is is there for those yeah. who can see it, for those who can participate in. And there is an eschatological moment where that will be, let's say, fully revealed or fully con consummated. But uh, there are saints that are glorified or saints that are that are illumined. We say they have reached that in in this life, and they are they're free. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it sounds a little bit like the, uh, the Westminster Catechisms. Uh, it, I think it starts off that the, the chief aim of man is to glorify God and, uh, and to find pleasure in him. I think it was some derivative of that in that, in that not only will we be glorified, but somehow we want, to, we want to be glorified. We want God to see it. And we want him to take notice of us and that we want to provide a little bit of satisfaction, a little bit of pleasure back to God. Not because he has something missing or he, or he actually gains something from our pleasure, just because he likes to see his he likes to see his children glorify and reflect him, that's, that so sounds that, a little bit a little bit like that. That you're taking part in the God in the relationship with the God. The the way like I would even I could go further and maybe say something that some people will find something scandalous is that there's an aspect of what the serpent said in the garden which is true, right? Uh, that is this is something that appears mostly also in the tradition in the Christian tradition and in Jewish tradition is that when God told Adam not to take the fruit. God was going to give Adam the fruit. God just didn't want Adam to take it for himself. And so that was actually the purpose, was that at some point God would give us the fruit. And that the idea is that we do, God is calling us to be like him, but we do that in humility, not in pride. Yeah. It's actually by abasing ourselves and by submitting ourselves to God that we are trans, transformed and carried up into him. And that's what Christ shows us, because Christ does exactly that. Christ eats the fruit. The whole symbolism of the cross is part of him eating the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. That's why he's between a good thief and a bad thief, because he's back in the garden and he's back in that place where he has to eat the fruit and he, he goes all the way to the end. God says, eat the fruit and you will die. Christ says, yes, I will eat the fruit and I will die. But he does it out of submission to the Father, not out of pride and a desire to be self-contained. And yeah. then that's the key to what God has called us to be from the beginning. I like, I like that because it's also it's also a symbol of the law. I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. That the the, the, the command was don't eat the fruit, but I'm going to go and eat the fruit. I'm going to go and do what I want to do, but I'm also going to fulfill the law. The, the law is done. This is a relationship of grace now with mankind. Yeah, and and he'll eat it. He eats the fruit in submission. He doesn't eat the fruit in pride. He eats the fruit and he accepts to die. Yeah, like you you could even almost understand that. When, when Adam ate the fruit, if he hadn't blamed uh, Eve, maybe there would have been a way out for him, right? But it was already done. Like as soon as he ate the fruit, he's like, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. That's right. And then God, Christ says, no, you know what? It's not my fault, but you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take that fault anyways. I'm gonna take it all, all of it I'm gonna take it, all the fault I'm gonna take on myself, even though it's not my fault. And I'm going to, I'm going to enter into that, into the garden, it, reverse in the reverse. I'm going to go back up. I'm going to die. I'm going to eat the fruit. And then I'm going to help all of humanity come into the garden with me. That's so it's like the, the story of crucifixion is, is all an answer to the garden. Like everything that happens is answering what happened in that first, in those first chapters of Genesis. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, I think it's important here just to interject the idea and the, and the, 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 the disclaimer here that we're not sure how all this works. All we believe is just somehow Belief that Jesus Christ um, is the Savior of the world and that He can represent us in our, in, our, in our standing before God, that somehow that sets us right and somehow that, somehow that offers us eternal life. Like, we don't know the true makeup of it. And it's just like, it's just like if, uh, you know, we, we have the science behind uh, nutrition about, about all the calories and the energy and stuff like that comes from food. And if one day it's, it's, it's dispelled that, that the, 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 the science behind the calories don't work, we're going to keep on eating just the same. It's, it's, it, the, the, how it works is, is not part of the, part of the, the, the basis, what, but the fact that it does work is what we're stating, that it, it works. And these are just, some of these are just theories a little bit of how, uh, how it works and how we interpret Scripture. It's good to stay humble. That's a good idea. <laughs> well, hey, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a businessman, so I, I, I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm way outside of my, my territory here. Uh, <laughs> And so, yeah. So, but I, I think that I think that that what's just to, just to be explicit about what's what's happening here is somehow God makes new men. The, the concept of theosis, the concept of justification, of sanctification, uh, the, the taking up of of God, um, uh, of mankind into God, uh, creating this this sort of new creature. That that the, the Christian belief is that this that this is the next stage of evolution. That the, the next stage of evolution is already happening. And that we have a, a man that has eternal life. Eternal not because of the duration of the life, but eternal because of the, of the quality of life. It is a godlike quality uh, that, that lasts, lasts forever and that, that that life doesn't end in death. The life goes through death into eternal life on the other side of it. 
Yeah, and and uh, there's a sense in which that we will rule with him and that especially some of us will definitely rule with him. Christ talks about becoming uh, kind of heads or principles in the yeah. world, becoming like angels and becoming those that rule over, over reality. And so I, there is this aspect that the transformation is a real transformation, right? It is, it is kind of going up this hierarchy of being and, uh, and then participating in how the world actually exists. And like you said, it's a mystery. It's not, it's not easy to totally understand how that works. We can have inklings of it when we notice, uh, when we notice how people play that role, like play these kind of heads of things. Um, but in Christ, it seems to be something that is far more permanent, let's say. Yeah, yeah. And so one of the, one of the, one of the, the, the quotes I, I at least wanted to put, put forth for your, uh, for your consideration, you being the, the sculpture, the art, the sculptor, the artist, is that uh, uh, this world is a great sculptor's shop. Uh, we're statues, and there's a rumor going around the shop that one day some of us are going to come to life. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, there's there, there's this hint, there's this essence in, in mankind, even before Christ coming, that that there's this rumor that hey, your eternal life's out there. How do we get to? It? And you see that you see this approach in uh, Alexander the Great, the search for the. Uh, uh, the, the fountain of, fountain of youth the fountain of yeah, yeah, yeah definitely yeah. you see you see that desire is there and uh you know also the, the all this idea of going into Hades and trying to get people out of Hades all of these myths that are there in the in the past are there to kind of point us to to something and yeah the, the fountain of uh, of eternal youth is definitely an image of Christianity before Christianity like a, an inkling of what it is that Christianity is actually going to end up offering yeah, yeah, and and it's and it's interesting if you talk about this this the sin into Hades, I mean what what we're talking about is is in, let's go back to Alexander the Great. You've got Plato and Aristotle all kind of clustered there together. Uh, Alexander's father gives him uh, Homer uh, uh, to read, and, and that's part of his that's part of his understanding about how the way the world works. And this guy goes on, and I think he's 30, 33, that he basically yeah. conquers the whole world, and, and then there's there's nothing but hope, hopelessness. But but what you see happening now, this is this is. 330 years before Christ, mm. something like that. What you, what you find interesting is that you read in John chapter 4 where Jesus is walking through Samaria, Samaria and he talks to this poor peasant woman. And this tells you something about God, that he's talking to a poor Samaritan woman uh, who's, who's an outcast of society, that uh, she, uh, she, she's offering to, to, to give him some water out of this, out of this well out in the middle of uh, Samaria. And he, sa and he says... Uh, uh, the, that water will, will cause you have to come back here day in and day after to drink, but the water that I give you is, is eternal life, is, is a water that lasts, and it'll, it'll, it's the wellspring up into eternal life. Eternal, and yeah. the interesting thing about that is that God uses Alexander the Great, the one figure in history that no one ever dares explain away as, as, a, as a figment of our imagination, the one concrete part of history, 300 years prior to Christ, to go in and conquer Samaria on the search for the fountain of youth. And 300 years later, here comes God incarnate talking to the poorest, simplest, most downtrodden woman about the fountain of youth in a place that Alexander ravished in his, mm. in his, in his exploits to it. And you, you see the complexities of God that, that were out at play hundreds of years before him, how he uses Homer, he uses Alexander Great, he uses Plato oh, yeah. and Aristotle in, that, in, in Stoicism, the Greek thought, in that you mentioned the Logos. Well, that's the thing is that once you realize that the world, let's say when I talked about attention and how the world cannot but happen through stories and that because attention has a pattern, it's not arbitrary. We're not, we don't put our attention on arbitrary things. We're not attracted to arbitrary things. We, we, there's a, there are things that capture our attention for reasons. And once you realize that, then you, you, you'll notice that the stories have they have the same patterns. And so and not just stories that we tell each other, but actually even the way we remember events and the way that events become important, right? If, there, if certain events are important to us because they have that pattern, they follow that pattern. And so just to, know, to look back into history and to see in Egypt or in Alexander or in all these other stories to see that, hey, there's some inkling. And it's funny because secular, these kind of secular historians, they use that to decry Christianity. They use that to say, hey, look, we found this, pa this version of a story that looks like Christ in, in the ancient world. Ha ha, you idiots, you believe in, in this story. And it's like, you know, it's the opposite. What are you talking about? I mean, this universal story that's like everywhere. And then, and then you're using it to debunk 
the fact that a story would manifest itself that way, I don't understand. It's like the flood is the same thing. They, they say the fact that there's a story of the flood in every culture somehow makes the flood irrelevant. It's like, uh, I think that's the opposite. I think the fact that there's a flood story in every single culture means that that story is something you should pay attention to because everybody remembers a story like that. It has definitely has meaning. Don't, don't discount it for that reason. That's right, that's right. And, and, and you, you, read, you read something like uh, Plato's Republic, and he talks about, he talks in there uh, kind of a, 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 a mental exercise, kind of an Einsteinian type of mental exercise where he says, imagine pure righteousness and, and a man full of pure righteousness in you. And he has this, this he accrues, someone of pure righteousness uh, would accrue to him, you know, a little bit of, of fame, a little bit of, uh, of honor, a little bit of dignity to him. And, and he could be righteous for the wrong reasons that, that, that imagine you take that, that man of righteousness and you stripped away all those things. And you put at play this concept and this view of him as pure evil, that that everyone castrated him and uh, and and castrated him down to to the level of 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 just a, just a, just just a trash heap. But he still maintained the concept of righteousness. Hmm. Then then what if, in Plato Plato writes like, what if we flog that man, and what if we scourge that man, and what hmm. ha, what if we we demean that man? And finally, what if we impaled that man, which is also the type of crucifixion that they would have used back then in Plato's time mm-hmm. in, in Greek, uh, Greece? What what would happen to that that righteousness, that pure righteousness? And now he says that 330, 375 years before Christ happens. Now, is it is it that he guessed that 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 would happen? That that it's just a figment? That's just a chance that that would happen? Or is it because Plato actually had a hint? Of wisdom, that 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 in the ocean of God's wisdom, that one drop should fall on Plato, and he should intuit that that would be the natural outflow of of of, of God. That that that, yeah. that that would be that that would be the hero arch- archetype. That would be the ultimate story. And I I don't think it's an accident. I think it's because Plato had wisdom. Yeah. Well, and and it brings us back to the idea that the world isn't arbitrary. The the world doesn't lay itself out in an arbitrary fashion. And so the story of the crucifixion isn't just this arbitrary thing you have to believe, right? It's like, because there are plenty of people that are crucified. There are plenty of people that had all kinds of things happen to them. We don't remember those stories. We don't tell those stories. The story we tell and the story we remember, we remember and we tell because it is an, an objective manifestation of a pattern which finds its culmination in that story. So the fact that ancients would intuit some aspect of it, not only is it, not only is it like surprising, it's, it would be surprising if that wasn't the case. Like, it'd be weird if, if like no one had an intuition of this pattern that's there and that's real and that's part of reality. Uh, and then all of a sudden it just happens. It's like, no, the, the, this is actually how reality works. And all the, all the, the this, this, these theories of sacrifice, these practices of sacrifices, you know, the idea of blood, the idea of, uh, uh, you know, all of these things that we saw in all cultures, we're intuiting some aspect of reality. We're moving, we're kind of moving towards something. And then when we see the story of Christ, it's like you're given the key and you can look back and say, oh, this is what, like, this is what this was going towards. Like it was all kind of heading towards this one story. Yeah. So it, it is, to me, that the, the type of argumentation that we hear, the kind of uh, secular historian argumentation, to me, it just, it just really rolls off my back. It, it doesn't have any effect on, on me because it's like, a, it, it's, a, it's a misunderstanding of how reality works. Uh, the world doesn't work the way they think it does. And so, yeah, yeah. And, and I, think, I think reintroducing the idea of the logos that you mentioned a few minutes ago is really important here because we talked about Plato. We talked a little bit about the, about the Greek thought and obviously the logos was at the, was at the forefront of, 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 of what they viewed as wisdom and, and what real, that's probably a topic that they discussed in the in the mm. streets there, and you look at you look at a passage that I think that you quoted earlier was 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 John one one. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. When you see His glory, the glory of the One and the Only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, um, or no, sorry, it was in in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. And in Him was life, and that life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. We see we see such a theologically rich. Uh, you know, handful of words right there that's really difficult to explain. And you mentioned the logos, literally the the word that 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 John uses in that in that passage. 
Uh, what, what is your understanding of the logos and the word as, that, as, as that's, that's constructed there, uh, especially, especially for the meaning of, of, of what the, 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 the precursors to Christ were and, and maybe what, what the meaning might, might be around that, that logos, that word? Yeah, so one of the things that, let's say, Christianity reveals in terms of the logos, it's something that I think was intuited a little bit before, yeah. is that, you know, so you have, for example, in the, the idea of Plato, you have the idea of the forms, which could be something like the logos in the sense that the essences of things that have a kind of eternal existence or that exist in, a, in another realm, and then they embody themselves in the world. Um, one of the things that uh, Christianity reveals to us is that those, those essences are always also purposes that they're also the reason why something exists. And so Christ, the Logos, is not just the, the essence, let's say, or say the origin of the world in the sense of essence, but he's also the reason. So that's why the world culminates into Christ as well. And he, so he's the source, he's the, the, the reason, and he's the end point, you could say, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And so that is something that Christianity really helps us to understand about how how reality works. And then you can actually understand reality that way as well, is that the logos of something, like the logos of a cup, right, is, is its origin, because without it, you wouldn't have a cup. And it's its reason, because it has a purpose, it's, which is to drink from, and then it's, 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 it's end. Like that's the, all those things come together into this notion of a, of, of a logos in, in the sense of the essence of something. I mean, the example I'm giving is very simplistic, but it helps us understand how let's say how reality works in a fuller way and it and it ends up being a participative way like it so it's not just these these forms that float up uh, in the world and that are that kind of embody themselves in the world but it's rather this idea that things come together in love headed towards their purpose headed towards their purpose which all of this is this massive process in all of reality all these things coming together in love aiming towards their purpose and then you have this fractal version of that where all of reality is aiming towards the absolute aiming towards the divine logos which is beyond everything and so it's it's actually a, like i said it's like a, it's like a picture of how the world works um and strangely enough it's a picture that right now in the world all of a sudden i think people can start to understand again it feels like for a few hundred years now people weren't able to even intuit that at all but it seems like right now with like the science of consciousness and and this this limit that science has reached in terms of the observer and the problem of the observer, like we're reaching a point where all of a sudden it's like, you know, this is what we've been talking about for two thousand years, folks. <laughs> yeah. This is actually how reality works. That's right. That's right. So yeah. So you you've got the you've got the word. I, th I think the word has multiple meanings. You've got the you've got the logos, and I've heard you speak to, speak before about the. Um, about the, the the kind of the transmission, I mentioned follow of Alexandria that had had the belief that there would be some sort of glue, there would be some sort of transition between mm. God, uh, heaven, and God. And he, he actually said that uh, I believe that one day we come from God a word with a capital W. Uh, so that so that that sort of thought was being at least espoused a little bit in Egypt with the Hellenistic Jews. Uh, and then you've got this concept of breath. I think I've heard you mention in the past, which is more of a Judea, uh, Judaistic, uh, Jewish uh, understanding of what the of what the word the word is. I mean, in terms of spirit, like in terms of what the, the idea of the, I mean, I, I always try to help people understand that the word spirit and the word breath is the same. Yeah. Uh, and that there's an, there's an analogy between these different levels of reality. That is, yeah. you know, your breath carries your word. That's right. right? And so like yeah. when you speak, your breath precedes the word, you could say it's like, it actually carries meaning. Uh, and so just like that, they help you understand what it means that there's a spiritual world, which is a world of meanings uh, that then kind of comes down and affects reality. Just like when you speak and you tell your son to, I don't know, like to mow the lawn, it's like that there's a causality there, right? You, you speak meaning into the world and the world can actually reveal that meaning. Uh, and so that's what breath is. It's this, this spirit in the sense of the the invisible aspect of reality, let's say. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. And so, and so, what what you're describing is sort of a tri triangulation that John's getting at by by using the the, the phrase "word" uh, as as God. You've got the uh, the 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 Platonists. You've got the the Greeks that are using "word" as logos. 
you have this Philo of Alexandria that's using it as kind of the glue, the, the mediator. And then you also have this idea from, the, from Judaism uh, that the word is, is the breath. Literally, the Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That, that whenever God speaks, it, it, it forms something concrete. And that, so that's so yeah. something real. The spirit like of God was hovering above the waters. And so you can imagine this spiritual reality and this chaotic potential at the bottom. So you have like a, the earth as chaos, and then you have the spirit of God above. That the, the, the world of meaning, let's say, is above, and then the world of potential is below. So it's really similar to what Aristotle and the Greeks talked about in terms of structure. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so it's interesting how one word in the New Testament can bring together three three different thought systems, the three living oh, yeah. thought systems of the world, and triangulate them around the personhood of Christ. Mm. Now, now, if, if someone's really, really smart, we, we've spoken about the intellectual atheists, we've talked, we've talked about the people that, that are essentially Gnostics that think that they know better, I would challenge them to spend every minute of every day for the rest of their lives trying to understand the first chapter of, Don, of John. They will not be able to do it in a, in a, in a, in a worthwhile manner because it is so theologically rich, it'll take the entire intellect, it'll take the entire personality, it'll take the entire body and energy and, and, and the entire being to be able to understand that, that one chapter, let alone all 66 books of Scripture. And mm. it's, it's so rich. And, and I think uh, uh, Wayne Grudem, uh, who, who, who wrote the, one of the systematic theology uh, textbooks that they used to train Baptists and, and uh, uh, Calvinist uh, uh, preachers, he, 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 he goes on, he writes a little bit about this, about this concept of, of the word, the breath, like you talked about, kind of the, the pronouncement. And, and what, he, what he says is, is, that, is that Christ is the pronouncement because it's through him all things were made. God, God works through Jesus Christ to create the his world. And it says in the beginning, they created the heavens of the earth. Uh, they, 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 it was them as a plural God that, that actually created in Genesis chapter 1. And that, mm -hmm. and that the, same, the same God that said, let there be light and there was light is also the same God that on the Sea of Galilee that woke up from his nap and told the storm to be, to be still. He said, peace be still. And the disciples commented to one another, who is this that even the wind of the waves obey him? And it's the same Christ that, that reaches down to the little girl who was sick and says, Talitha Kumi, little girl, arise. And she, and she wakes up and rises up. And it is the same Jesus. Jesus is the same God at the creation of the, of the world. That, that walks up to his friend's tomb who's been dead for three days, to Lazarus' tomb, and, and he says, roll away, roll away the stone. And they said, Jesus, but his body already stinks. He's already been dead for three days. He's already, he's already rotting. It stinks and just flies in there, all sorts of things. He says, roll, roll it away anyway. And he, roll, they, he commands them to roll away the stone. And then he says, he says Lazarus, come forth. And Damn. that heap of dirty old fly-filled skin and bones had no option whatsoever than to form itself, stand up, and come forth. Because as Grudem says, the power is delivered with the command. That God's command is never delivered without, without the power to obey that command. And that whether we're a, di we're, we're a dead corpse, or we're a little girl lying on a, on a bed, or we're a storm, that Christ calls us to come forth and he gives us the power to do so. It is very fascinating to notice that a lot of the miracles that you mentioned, which you see is you actually see a replaying of the creation. You actually see this image of, of God, uh, you know, you could imagine it, it's imagistic that like God reaches in and pulls the earth out of the waters, right? So he says, let, let the, 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 so the dry earth comes out of, out of the waters. He pulls this order out of chaos. And this is what Christ is constantly doing when he is healing people. He's pulling people out of this chaos, out of death. He's, he's, uh, he's uh, submitting the waters, just like the waters in the, in the first chapter of Genesis, that you have these chaotic waters and then the breath of God is there. And in speaking, there's order that comes out of it, stability. So Christ walking on the waters, Christ, Christ calming the storm, Christ resurrecting the dead. Uh, all of these are to show that the creator is there and that the same person that brought the world into being is now making showing you through these little versions of recreation what it is that he's doing in the world uh you know healing the sick all of these are all these these images of having this chaotic thing in front of you and then bringing order bringing life bringing pattern back out of this chaotic world yes yes so, so the, 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 picture, the picture behind you, I think, is Jonah and the sea monster. Uh, 
Well, it's based on Jonah and the sea monster, but it's actually... Uh, it's not, it's a, it's actually not a photo Christ. of the actual sea monster in real Jonah? <laughs> exactly. Well, it, what it is, it's actually uh, Christ receiving the martyrs who died in communist prisons. And so it was painted by a Romanian artist, but it follows the tropes of Jonah in the sense that the, the way that you show the monster is the way that you would show Jonah's monster and the people coming out would be like Jonah coming out of the of the fish. And so it's bringing all those images together, together to create a new image, but it's traditional in the sense that you recognize what what's happening and is Christ receiving these martyrs. Uh, I like to keep that there. Uh, when I saw it, I wanted it. I, I, you know, I contacted the artist and wanted to purchase it from her because um, I feel like we need to, to keep our eyes on that because it's, it's uh we need to stay ready for for uh for that kind of stuff that's right that's right and of course yeah. of course the the essence of the story of jonah is that if, if you try to evade the will of god that god will god will come get you and put you in his will i mean and so and so it's best to live within the will of god than, than, to, than to try to abandon that will and run away from it yeah it's the, the thing about the story of jonah is that it really is the story of uh of the whole story it even ends with saving the city, just like the revelation ends with this uh, saving the city, with this like the city that's glorified. Uh, but it's it's funny because it's it's actually to show you that if like you said, if even if you don't want to follow God's will, it's going to happen. It's just going to be more painful. You know, it's not going to be as fun, but you know, it's still going to happen. The story is going to happen no matter what. You can't stop it. That's right. That's right. So it it, see, it seems like uh, you really view your work as an artist, uh, as, an, as an act of worship, an act of, act of maybe participating a little bit uh, and being made an image of God, being a creator, because you're, you're, you're made by a creator. Um, and so talk, talk a little bit about, about your, your theology of work and in, in what you do. Well, I mean, I really am very fortunate. I'm very blessed, I could say, that I have a chance that everything I'm doing is really kind of participating in this this celebration and this this uh, this joyful celebration of the of the church of the life of Christ and ultimately all moving this all up to towards God, um, and so I I really fell in love with the traditional language that Christians develop in terms of art and and I have a chance to participate in that you know I the the difference between let's say traditional art and modern art is that it is really participative so the images I make aren't just there to go decorate some random person's house. You know, they're there to, to remind them of a holy person, remind them of Christ, participate in their, their, uh, their, their spiritual life one way or the other. And it's usually a commission. So someone will actually specifically ask me for something that I make for them. And so it is, becomes a communal act as well. It becomes an act of participating in that person's life, in the life of the church, and ultimately in all of our worship that is, is is given up towards God, so yeah. that's what that's kind of how I see what I'm doing. So I, I'd like to I'd like to close um, or wind down our time today to to get your thoughts on what are the implications behind the resurrection? Because Christ has 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 been raised up from the dead. What does that mean? Like what what's the so what <laughs> of the of the message? <laughs> I'm pretty sure not going to pierce all the mysteries of the resurrection. That's for sure. But <laughs> I think that I think that w what it shows us is that there is there is necessarily a reality above just the material reality. This is this is something that has to exist, and that there is a manner in which all of that is contained. Ultimately, will be contained in God. That it it will have an it will have a it's not a finite thing, and so. The resurrection is, you know, because it's very mysterious to understand exactly what that means and what it means in terms of phenomena, but that it is the promise that we are, we will participate in the totality, that we will have a place in how all of it comes together in the end, and that we will participate in that, and that we will, that we're not just these shadows that vanish into, into darkness, but rather that all of this comes together. And so that's what I, what I see and that Christ is the first seeds of that and shows us, uh, you know, shows us the mystery of all the other resurrections that we witness all the time, like we talked about, you know, whether it is, you know, a seed going into the ground and giving a tree from a dead, from a dead plant, whether it is uh, all of the, these cycles of the sun that go down and comes up, uh, all of this is to help us understand how there is a pattern, because you can notice that it's a pattern. And this pattern of reality has a, has a totality an infinite totality, and we are called to participate in that. It's not; it doesn't go away. That's right. That's right. And I think 
I think one of the, the most impactful uh, lines in, in, in the New Testament is, is going a few verses, a few chapters back in John, John 14, 19, I believe, that says, Christ says, because I live, you also will live. Hmm. It's definitive. There's a period there. And his life has implications for us. And, and, and that resurrection, everything changes. Everything changes. It's a different, it's an entirely different world. I mean, you think you think about we're sitting in the year 2021. Why is it 2021? Because they realigned all of time into BC and AD. I mean, because of yeah, one you can't person. Get, and you can't get out of it. They can't. They can't get out of it. They tried to create new terms like common era or whatever. And calling it common era is hilarious because it's it's almost like a compliment to Christianity. It's almost like saying, wait, so you're saying that Christianity brought about a common era? That's pretty amazing. <laughs> it's like, I wouldn't even have dared say that, but I guess you're saying it. So let's just celebrate that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so the entire so the entire world is oriented towards the the the, the life birth perfect life and and resurrection of uh, of Jesus Christ and uh, we we recognize it every single time we do, we look down at our watches and see what time it is it's it's yeah exactly it, it's amazing it's amazing yeah. well Jonathan thanks so much for your time thanks so much for for sharing a little bit of your love and your passion uh, for your work and for your belief and your faith uh, with us um, we're gonna put some links down to your to your websites there I, I did I did order the Jonah picture I think there's a colorized version of the Jonah and the great sea monster. <laughs> Uh, that I ordered because I just loved it so much. It just it just had so much rich meaning there, and so I'm I'm hoping to, hoping to get that today. I think day or tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to to reflecting on your comments and your thoughts on that and thinking about you uh, during that time. But uh, but thank thanks so much for for your passion and your willingness to, to really share your faith with, with everyone. Yeah, and thank you for this great conversation. I really I really I actually learned quite a few things, you know, in some of the information that you brought about. So, I'll be also meditating on some of the things you talked about in the next few hours. I'll be like, "Hmm, yeah, that's interesting." So, thanks, thank you for that. <laughs> Remember, I'm not a trained theologian, so you have to take everything I said with a with a disclaimer that I I am not I'm not trained. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I I, pre I appreciate appreciate your honesty and, and I, I I certainly have some things to reflect on. Uh, in, in, in response to this. But uh, thank you. Thanks so much for your time. I, 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 I count you now as a friend and, and look forward to staying in touch with you. Yeah, anytime. It was wonderful. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Sean.